folks, would we? Amen. And so uh, this morning, uh, if you would, turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark this morning. Mark chapter 8. I'll be reading verses 13 through 21. The title of my message this morning is Take Heed, Beware of the Leaven. Take heed, beware of the leaven this morning. Look at Mark chapter 8. Look at verse number uh, 13. The Bible says, and this is very important, and he left them. And entering into the ship again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It's because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye, because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand. Have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see ye not. Having ears, hear ye not. And do ye not remember? When I break the five loaves among the five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they say unto him, Twelve. And when the seven among the four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they said, Seven. And he said unto them, How is it that ye do not understand? Before I pray this morning, I want to quote J.C. Ryle. Um, this is what J.C. Ryle wrote. He said, Remember what is recorded here of the disciples. It may help to correct the high thoughts which we are apt to entertain of our own wisdom and to keep us humble and lowly minded. For there is more ignorance in our hearts than we are all at all aware of. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we come before you this morning. And as we see Mark, as he's carried along by the Holy Ghost, recording the very words of Christ. Father, may we remember what J.C. Ryle wrote. Salvation is fully and completely of God himself. Jo uh, or excuse me, Jonah said it twice, in fact, in his book, that salvation belongeth unto the Lord. And Father, this morning, I want to certainly concur with J.C. Ryle, because many times we lose sight of the wonderful work of God in our own hearts. We, too, were blind. We, too, were dull of hearing. We, too, were dull of understanding. And it wasn't until the Holy Spirit of God came and <coughs> opened our eyes that we might see. Until the Holy Spirit regenerated us and placed that heart of flesh within us that we might understand. And opened those ears that have been stopped that we might hear this morning. And so, fathers, we continue through our text this morning. We're going to conclude the first portion of... Those men who hated Christ beyond measure. Those who were, as we said earlier a couple weeks ago, who were willfully blind. They hated Christ with an unbelievable hatred. And Father, we're going to move this morning into that blindness which the disciples experienced. Which was not one of malice, but one of just misunderstanding. Because the Spirit had not opened their eyes and ears to hear what Christ was saying to them. And finally, Father, we're going to see next week, Lord willing, that wonderful work as you open the physical eyes of a man who was blind physically. And it's then that the disciples, when they're asked, who do you say that I am? And they say, we have come to know and believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says to Peter, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father, which is in heaven. And Father, this morning, we pray again this wonderful and amazing work of salvation that you do alone. Father, we, again, with all humbleness, certainly no pride or any expectations of that. We have nothing to bring. We are wretches, as we sang this morning. We mocked you before the Spirit of God came. That's our prayer this morning as Paul prayed in Romans chapter 10. 
Father, my heart's desire and prayer to God is that Israel might be saved. And Father, it's our prayer and our heart's desire that anyone sitting amongst us this morning, and there always is those who are lost sitting there, almost looking like a sheep and yet a goat. So Father, we pray, it's our earnest prayer that you'll move in the hearts and that your will, as it always is, will be fulfilled and done and completed. Now we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, maybe seated this morning. We uh, certainly remember, brothers, that's the wonderful thing about uh, expository preaching. Amen. We remember from the last Lord's Day morning in which we were together in the Gospel of Mark that our Lord and Savior had once, have been, once again, brethren, been reunited with those men who hated him with a most utter hatred. And we remember, don't we, that Mark then, for us, puts on full display, amen, as he is under the inspiration of God, he records for us their utter and brethren, their willful blindness concerning who the Lord Jesus Christ really is. It's an amazing thing. And then, as they spiral and they continue to go down into the depths of their pernicious ways. Don't you love that word? That's an old English Bible word, amen. As they continued in their pernicious ways, as they continued down deeper and deeper, the Bible says there in those verses we looked at a couple weeks ago that they tempted the Lord Jesus Christ, that they were there with an argumentative attitude. And, the, and really, when you look that up, it means that they wouldn't shut up. You've, you've been around those kind of men. We certainly talked about that, amen? And then they went even deeper into the depths of that, and they asked the Lord of glory, who has been healing people and raising the dead and stilling the storm, they said, hey, look, we want to see a sign from heaven. We remember this, amen? We remember what Mark recorded there for us. And finally, it's an amazing thing, brothers. These fools, these twofold children of hell, and you say, ooh, that's... That's roughly. No, Jesus, that's what he called them. Amen. That's exactly what he called them when he was standing before them. Matthew 23, go look it up. 18 times he calls them hypocrites. But these men are standing there, and they're in their contentious and quarrelsome conversation, brethren, by tempting the Lord Jesus in the same modus operandi. We remember we looked at that as their father, the devil, did in the wilderness. Amen. We remember this. This is where we're at. This is who he is dealing with this morning. And so Mark begins our narrative this morning in verse 13 with a most relevant, brethren, and a most tragic pronouncement that certainly applies to many today and maybe even applies to some of us in this room this morning. Notice verse 13, how verse 13 starts there, brethren. He says, and he left them. Now, brethren, it is a terrifying thing to think about this for a moment. Jesus, God himself, has been teaching these men and teaching these men and standing before them. And what does the Bible say? He says that the Bible says here that he got into the boat and he left them, brother. It is a terrifying thing for the Lord Jesus Christ to turn his back on those who refuse to believe. It's an amazing thing. This is so relevant for all of us this morning. He addresses so many of these areas. And even, brother, in this morning, as we have seen them reject God the Father, we've seen them reject the Holy Spirit of God, and now, even in our text, to this very hour in our text, we see them continuing to, re to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing, brother, and it really, really is. And my plea as we begin our text this morning, as it always should be, brother, and maybe you are one of those this morning. Amen? Who's been sitting under the Word of God, who's been hearing the Bible priest, who's been continuing to hear it, and yet you continue to reject and reject and reject. And really what you're going to see here, brethren, is that the same thing that happened to these men will happen to you. Your heart will become hard to the things of God. You will become callous to the truths of the Bible. And the Lord Jesus will turn and walk away. You'll become just like these Pharisees. And so this morning, Jesus in his graciousness as he's leaving them, as he gets in the ship and sails eastward to Galilee where he was going, he begins to have a conversation with his disciples, brethren. And I want you to see this wonderful warning. This is the thing, right? We, we talk about this a lot in our church, and those who teach here at our church, amen, are constantly concerned 
with being as best we can, brethren, we are not perfect by any stretch, but as best as we can be as we read the scriptures and we systematically and, and uh, exegetically go down through the verses to, to be, as we say, cut it straight, to be as truthful as we can. And so this morning, the Lord Jesus gives us all, along with his disciples, a wonderful blessing by giving him this warning. Look here, if you would, at Matthew or Mark chapter eight. Look at verse number uh, number uh, thir- or numbers fourteen and fifteen. We we just kind of, if you would, categorize thirteen. Look at verses fourteen and fifteen. And here again, our Lord and Jesus Christ gives us a heed and a warning. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. Now look at verse fifteen. And he charged them, saying, Take what. Take he. Now, brethren, it's really, really, really important. As I said, he is most gracious here in verse 15 as he charges them and warns them with the words, take he. Do you know what the words take he mean together? Listen, it means to stare at. Listen, to gaze with wide open eyes as at something remarkable. So in other words, Jesus is calling them, brothers, to become aware of what he's about to say. Take he, brethren, this is the idea as we look narrowly at what he's about to say. He's drawing their attention and telling them, look narrowly, brethren. Take heed at what I'm about to say. In fact, he uses this term, this, this exact phrase, four times in the Gospel of Mark. I want to look at one of them. Look at Mark chapter 13. And I want you to see here what he tells his disciples to take heed concerning. Look at Mark chapter 13. And again, this is really, really important. This is why we are continually speaking of these things. Mark 13, look at verse number 5. Look what it says. And Jesus answering them begins to say, what's those next two words? Take heed. heed. Lest any man, what? Deceive you. What what are these men going to be deceiving about? Look what he says here. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am who? I am Christ. He says, brethren, take heed. In other words, stare at as something amazing and wonderful and amazing. Take heed, brethren. There's going to be people who come. And they're going to say, I'm the Christ. Just like when we went to uh, went down to uh, MacArthur's and we went to the Shepherd Conference and we were walking out on the pier there. Out there was that Forrest Gump, right? Forrest Gump, he, his first restaurant, we were there. And we're walking on the pier and, and there's this guy. I hate to even say it. He called himself Cowboy Jesus. And he was claiming to be Christ. It's an amazing thing. And so, of course, you can't walk by without saying something. Amen. I mean, it's an amazing thing. You draw it out. This is, people are insane. And yet, people are flocking by. There are many who will say, I am the Christ. Jesus says to take heed, brethren, to watch narrowly concerning this very important matter. I am Christ and shall deceive many. Look at another one. Look what Paul tells us over here in the book of Acts. Using the same terminology, the same words, the same meaning, again, Jesus says, take heed lest you be deceived. Look what Paul says here in Acts chapter 20 as he's speaking to the church, as he's getting ready to, uh, ready to leave. He says there in verse number 28, look what he says. First two words are, take heed therefore unto yourselves and on all the flock. In other words, he says, you must be careful, brethren. Take heed unto these things. Watch carefully and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. To feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And he's concerned about grievous wolves coming in, brother. Not only that, he said, you've got to take heed. You've got to watch these these grievous wolves that will come in. And not only was he concerned about grievous wolves coming in, he said, take heed to those who are here. Watch those, brother. There will be men who will arise from your own what? From your own selves. Oh, brothers, listen. Brethren, this is a needful thing. Jesus here again is warning his disciples Take heed, brethren. Be very, very, very careful. Look at, look at the third one. So we, he tells us to take heed, don't be deceived. He tells us to take heed, don't be, you know, uh, watch out for the grievous wolves and those men who look like pastors and they're not. Look at the next one. Just another one, just a couple more. First Corinthians, just to give you a little like, sampling of this. is just a few samplings of how important this is as Jesus addresses his disciples there. Look 1 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse number 9. Again, a very probably a very familiar portion of scripture to all of us. So take heed, don't be deceived. Take heed, watch the grievous wolves. 
What does he say here? Verse 9, for we all laborers together with God. You're God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man, what? Take heed, brethren. Look what he says. Ah, we buildeth thereupon. Listen. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Again, Paul is warning us, brethren, take heed how you build. Take heed in the foundation that you're laying in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a stern warning from him and a stern warning from, from Scripture. And finally, just one more, just because it's fun. 1 Timothy, look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. Again, we've got, take heed you don't be deceived. Take heed that you watch for the grievous wolves that will come in. Take heed in the foundation that you build, how you build it. Finally, Paul tells young Timothy, the young pastor here, as he lays, as he's uh, preparing himself to exit the, the battle of war, the course which God has led him on. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. Look, brethren, again. Look at verse number uh, 14. Look at verse number 14. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which is given thee by prophecy, and with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Look at verse 16. Take heed unto thyself. Take heed, brethren, unto thyself, and unto what? The doctrine. the doctrine. Oh, there's that nasty word that nobody ever wants to talk about. Oh, it causes so much division, and praise God it does. You know it's designed to do that. Yeah. It's designed to do two things. Number one, it's to divide truth and error, yeah. light and darkness. It's, it's designed to do that, yes. And it's also designed secondarily. You know what it does secondarily, brethren? Doctrine brings those who hold to the fundamental things of Christ together. Amen. Isn't that a wonderful thing? It divides truth. And Paul tells young Timothy, hey, brother, hey, young pastor, you need to take heed in the doctrine which you are teaching. Why? Look at what it says. <laughs> Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt, what? Save, Save thyself and them that hear the oh brethren pastoring a church preaching an elder teaching a sunday school class there is much much for us to consider much for us to understand he says to take heed on these things brethren and again there are many other things that we see there we are to gaze with wide open eyes as it's something remarkable we are to take heed concerning the spiritual matters the spiritual things in our lives that jesus is talking about now look back there at mark chapter 8 look at verse 15 we're going to spend just a little bit of time here there's some things here that i want us to see uh together this 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 morning not this afternoon yes look back at mark chapter 8 and uh, look there again at verse 15 look what he says and he charged them saying take heed what are we to take heed to up brother you remember context 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 it's always context Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of who? Of Herod. Now, he warns his disciples here contextually to beware of the leaven of these two groups of people. Now, the word leaven is really quite simply another word for yeast. Those of you who cook could certainly understand that. You take a little pinch of yeast, put it in a little dough, and that thing just takes off. It's an amazing thing. It gasses and does all these things I don't understand. But it's an amazing thing. It's another word for yeast that when mixed with a larger quality of dough produces fermentation, causing it to rise. Now listen, brother. In holy writ, this is very important. In holy writ, it is used as a metaphor to describe, listen, an influence. Any influence, listen, any influence, amen, working silently and strongly that causes changes in things or in opinions. Can I read that again? It is used as a metaphor in scripture, brethren, as, as the idea here, an influencing work, and notice it works silently, and it works strongly, that then brings about a change in things, which it would do in bread as it causes it to rise, or in opinions. And we find this used, brother, this is important, because most of the time, leaven is a metaphor which is used to describe sin and wickedness and evilness, but not always. 
And so let's do this this morning. Let's just have a little lesson on leaven this morning, should we? I, I like, I, you know, we could get, you know, some of these cooks up here. They could probably give me, a, you know, an analogy of, of cooking with leaven. But let me show you biblically what leaven does. And this is why he says, this is why he tells them to beware of the leaven. Look with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Luke chapter 13. Let's just look over one chapter here again, as I say. The majority of the time, it is something that's metaphorically used to describe sin, which secretly works, and wickedness, and these things, with much power. But look at Luke chapter 13, and we see here the Lord Jesus Christ himself using this terminology. Look at verse number 18. Look at Luke 13. Look at verse number 18. Look what Jesus says. Then said he, unto what is the kingdom of God like, and whereunto shall I, re shall I resemble it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and cast into his garden, and it grew and waxed a great tree, and the fowls of the air lodged in the branches of it. Now look at verse 20. And again he said, Whereunto shall I liken the kingdom of God? It is like what? Leaven. Leaven which a woman took and hid in, in, in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. Brother, it's an amazing thing. What, 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 what Jesus is teaching with this metaphor of leaven, again, is as God reigns in heaven, brother, listen, even this morning, brother, you know what? As we're preaching the gospel, as we're looking at the Bible together, even now God's kingdom is continuing to grow. Can you see that? I can't see that. But this is the idea that Jesus is saying. His kingdom will grow. God is reigning. His kingdom will grow. He will add to his kingdom as he sees fit. And then he says, this is really very simple. It's just like leaven. Those of you who put it in bread and watched it. Isn't it wonderful to have such a wonderful illustration? It really is. Look at another one. Again, just three times in the New Testament is it used in a very distinct way. And again, context, context, context. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Again, a church that was well known. A church that is well known, brethren, for many issues, many problems, and we've talked about it before. They had way more problems than we've ever dealt with, way more serious issues than we've ever dealt with here in the church, I can tell you that. And yet, look what Paul does as he is now speaking to the church. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verse number 6. Verse number 6, look what it says. Your what? Glory. Glory. Your boasting, your pride-filled, arrogant attitude, brothers, is not good. Look what it says. Know ye not that a little what? Leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Verse 7. What's that word? Purge it out, brethren. This is what he's saying. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, even Christ, our Passover, which is sacrificed for us. Look at verse 8. Therefore, let us keep the, the feast. Not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of what? Malice and wickedness. Do you see what he's doing here? Paul here is telling us, the Bible's telling us what the particular leaven is that he's addressing. Malice and wickedness. And believe you me, there was much malice and wickedness in that church. Paul is saying, like a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump, brothers. You need to purge that out of the church. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? We, we, we get all, oh, that seems so harsh. But actually, that's church discipline. That's how they did it. You know what I'm saying? Look what he says there as you go on. Look at what he says. Neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of what? Sincerity and truth. And so we see here again, as I said, Paul makes the point uh, that just as at the Passover meal, you remember, brothers, I, we don't have to go back in Jewish history you remember what they were told to do the night of the Passover meal? They were told to what? They were told to search through their house. They were to look at every cranny under every, every towel in every corner and remove all the leaven out, brother. Take it all out because it is there a picture of sin as it is Paul here. And Paul references that. He says, hey, remember the Passover feast? Yes, the night that God called them out of Egypt. They went so fast they didn't have time to put leaven in. They had no time to rise. Take that out, brother. Take the sin out. Because it's an amazing thing, isn't it? Have you noticed it? Maybe it's just me in my own life. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. When I let a little sin go, you know what happens. You know it as well as I do. You know what it does? It grows. And it grows. And it grows. 
And the next thing you know, you know what? You're doing something you would have never imagined doing or thinking for that matter. Paul says, he tells the church, you need to get that leaven out. That sin needs to go because what it does then it promotes others. It says like we're saying it's okay. And it's not okay, brethren. It's not okay. It's an amazing thing. So Paul, under the inspiration of God here, uses leaven to symbolize sin that defiles the believer and disrupts the church's worship of God. Amen? This is what he's doing. Look just at one more and then we'll, we'll move on. But the idea of leaven, again, in the Bible, look at Galatians chapter 5. Look at Galatians chapter 5. And Paul, again, is deeply concerned. You know, you know what's amazing is that we, uh, we read these wonderful inspired letters... And then when you say something along the lines of, well, I would like to be in that church. I'd like to be in the church at Galatia. I would have liked to have been at the church at Ephesus. And probably we would have, amen. But this is why the letters were written to the church. These epistles, they, these pastoral epistles were written to the church to help us. And they had troubles just like we do. And again, Paul addresses and uses this proverb here, if you will, in Galatians chapter 5. Look at verse number 2. You remember what was happening. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be what? Circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now, brothers, we know how the letter opened. He says, we, or an angel from heaven, do what? Preach another gospel. May they be what? Anathematized. May they be cursed with hellfire. This is what Paul said not once but twice. And here again, he's dealing with this idea. Listen, this is why, brethren, when we, when we freak out about, you know, the five solas, you know, by faith, through grace, by the Holy Spirit alone, to God's glory alone, when we go down those, the Bible alone, this is why, because men have added so much to the gospel. It's not even funny. I mean, do this, do that, do this, do that, do this, do that, and God's going to give you credit. No, he's not. He's going to condemn you because your works can do nothing but condemn you. Amen. You trust Christ. His work Amen. then is imputed to you. Amen? Amen? Think of this for a moment. We prayed about it this morning. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ after the Spirit of God has awoken your dead soul. And you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Think of this for a moment. He imputes his righteousness to you. He imputes his work on the cross, that which is finished. His death becomes yours. His resurrection gets imputed to you. His resurrection becomes yours. It's an amazing thing when you understand that. Now listen, I'm going to say something. It's going to rip you, but think it through for a moment. This is why the whole idea, how can I say this? The understanding and thinking that the blood of Christ, that Jesus died for everyone, which he did, his blood is effectual enough to save everyone, but he doesn't, and it doesn't. You say, well, you're limiting his atonement. No, I'm not. I'm just simply saying what you would say. I just say it's a particular thing. God imputes that to him. Imputes that to you. Amen? That's nothing. It's just a view of, I believe it's very particular. I don't believe God is out there just hoping somebody gets saved. I believe he draws them. I believe he imputes it to them. I believe he gives it to them. Just like he gave it to me and to you if you're saved this morning. And hopefully, Lord willing, our children and our grandchildren and everybody else. Amen? But this is a most needful thing when you think about that. Paul says here, in verse 3, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. For we, uh, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness of faith, by faith. For in Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith, which worketh by God. Listen to verse 7. Ye did run well. Hey, listen, you started out well. You believed in faith alone, through Christ alone, amen, the Bible alone, all these things. And then look what he says to them. He says, who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that, what, calleth you, listen, a little leaven leaveneth the whole what? lump. One false doctrine on top of another false doctrine, on top of another false doctrine, brother, leads to fermenting the whole 
church. Paul says, be careful, brother. Take heed concerning the leaven. It's a very, very dangerous thing. Amen? Now look back here again. Contextually, we're going to look at this. We're going to look at this together again. So we've got kind of a general idea of what leaven is. Look at Mark chapter 8. He specifically names the Pharisees and Herod. And uh, is it 12 o'clock already? Oh my goodness. Look at Mark chapter 8. We'll, uh, we'll finish this along here. Look at verse 15 again there. We'll spend a little time here. And he charged them saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. You remember, brethren, that the context of Scripture tells us which the leaven really is, which is spread slowly and quietly. Jesus warns them here concerning the leaven of the evil influences of the Pharisees and Herod. And you say to yourself, what are, the, what are these evil influences? What is really the leaven that he's talking about here? Well, brethren, I'm telling you, there's a list of things you could go to Scripture in and say, that's the leaven of the Pharisees. No question about it. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to, to, to uh, Matthew chapter 16. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll do this. We'll, we'll pay careful attention again to these important things that he's talking about. Look at Matthew 16. And uh, look at verse number 11. Look at verse number 11. And uh, basically, we have here the, re the same biblical story, or same biblical truth being told by Matthew, who gives us a little more detail Look at verse 11. How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Look at verse 12. Then they what? Then understood they how that he bade them not to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine, look at, of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. This is what he's warning them about. He's warning, hey, it's not just any old leaven. What I'm concerned with is what you just saw. These men who have been rejecting me and rejecting me, I'm concerned about what you have just seen. And he says, brothers, beware of their leaven. Because a little leaven, what? Leaven is the whole lump. He says, be careful of their leaven. Look at Luke chapter 12. Look over here again. He, he, he tells us, the Bible clearly tells us, what it is, look at Luke chapter 12, there isn't, you know, we're not standing here sucking our thumbs trying to guess, what is it? What is he saying to them? Thankfully, we have inspired scripture to go to. Verse number one, Luke 12, look at verse number one. In the meantime, when they were gathered together in a numeral multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware ye of the leaven of what? The Pharisees, which is what? Hypocrisy. You see that there, brethren? He's warning them, listen, there's nothing worse. I can't think of anything worse. I was telling Brother Keith this earlier. There, there's nothing worse that I can think of, brother. Amen? That our church would turn into something where everybody comes and sits in the pews, and then the pastor's the actor on the stage, and he's giving everybody a show. May it never be. This is what Jesus accused them of, hypocrisy, of being a hypocrite. You know what a hypocrite is? When he called them that 18 times in Matthew 23, it literally means an actor on a stage. You're just an actor on a stage. Here, he says, brethren, beware of these hypocrites. Beware of what they do. Now, Jesus warns his disciples there to beware of them. The leaven of skepticism and unbelief. Now, here's what I want us to see. So he tells them specifically, contextually, we see widely through Scripture that this, this leaven touches a whole lot of things. But let me show you what he's specifically talking about right here in this passage. Turn with me in your Bibles. What did he say? The leaven of the who? The Pharisees and of who? Of Herod. What do you think the Pharisees and Herod would have in common? What would the Pharisees and Herod have in common that Jesus is speaking of here? Well, I'm glad you asked. You guys are very inquisitive this morning, amen? Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 23. Look at Luke chapter 23. What would, Fer what would the Pharisees and Herods have in common that Jesus would say, hey, watch out for this stuff. Watch out for this leaven. Be careful of this leaven. Look at Luke chapter 23. And uh, look at verse number 8. Look at verse number 8. And when who? Herod saw Jesus. 
he was exceeding glad. Herod was glad to see him. For he was de uh, desirous to see him a long season, because he had heard many things of him. Listen. And he what? He hoped to have seen somewhat a miracle done by him. You want to know the commonality that the Pharisees and Herod had in, had in common here? You know what it was? They were looking at Jesus in unbelief and saying, I want a sign. And brothers and sisters, listen to me. When you live in signs, when you live in that world of, of, of charismaticism, this signs and wonders, brother, all it does is cause you a hardened heart. Because I got news right for you right now. Listen, Howard could attest, there's many that could attest this morning in the sitting in our church, the devastating damage that that causes. When you are standing there looking under every rock, looking for every sign and every wonder that comes along, Jesus says, don't get involved in that, brethren. Not too much. Don't let it engulf you. Because what will happen is you'll become just like them. Hold on a minute. Think about this for a moment. And again, this is why I read J.C. Ryle. I don't want to seem too puffed up because I am not. But can you imagine this for a moment? I just saw God speak to the winds. And they stopped. I just saw God raise a dead girl over here. I saw God touch a man with leprosy and it was healed like that, which was, as we looked when we looked at it, that's not possible apart from the miracle of God. And you know what they're doing? They're standing there denying who he is. Jesus says, don't become involved in the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod, who is constantly looking for a sign. Be careful, brethren. We must be extremely careful. Again, leaven design, as it's spoken of in Scripture, surely is represents sin and those wicked things. But he contextually is referring back to Mark chapter 8. And let's just read that together. Look at verse 11. Look at Mark chapter 8. Look at verse number 11. This really is what he's doing contextually. He says, And the Pharisees came forth and began to question him, seeking on him what? A sign from heaven and tempting him. He's saying, Don't do that. Don't. Do that. Be very, very, very careful. Amen? Now, look back there, if you would, at verse 16. Mark 8, look at verse number 16 as we uh, try to uh, move along here. Look at what the Bible says there. And this, again, is where you get into some very interesting things. He says, and they reason among themselves, saying, is because we have no bread. Now, brethren, again, here's what gets displayed for us. This, brethren, you remember, the Pharisees hated Christ. There was much malice with their unbelief. Here the disciples, you remember, we talked about it a couple weeks ago. His disciples are walking around, remember, in oblique. They're walking around in the smoke trying to see if they can't see clearly. And we see this thing right here. This is what's happening to them. They are not, uh, it, 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 as I said, with malice trying to figure this out. They are sitting there going, we've seen these things, but we haven't seen them. We've heard these things, but we really haven't heard them. We're walking around in the smoke, and they're saying, why is he still talking about this? I don't quite understand it. And brethren, I'm with him. Amen? I mean, you can certainly be with him concerning some things in Scripture, for sure. But you, you see this here, this blindness that the, that the disciples have as Jesus begins to, uh, begins to deal with them. Now, let's finish this up. I want us to take note here, if you would. As Jesus continues, they're sitting in the boat going... What, 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 what is he talking about? I still don't understand it. I want you to see what Jesus does here. And I want you to count in your mind or on your fingers the number of questions that he now asks them. As they're sitting in the boat going, is it because we didn't have any bread? Look at nine questions. He addresses them with nine questions. Look, if you will, there at verse 17. Look what it says there. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason? Because you have no bread? Question mark. <laughs> and I want you to notice, because all of the first five, listen, the first five questions of these nine questions, Jesus addresses their dullness of understanding. Again, he says, Why don't you understand? Question number one. Look at here what he says. Listen to the words. Why reason ye? Because ye have no bread. Listen, 
Perceive ye not yet, neither understand? Question mark. Number two, have ye heart yet hardened? Number three, again, you see what he's doing. He's, he's drawing this out. He's drawing them in to consider what he's just done. Look at verse 18. Having eyes, see ye what? Not? Question mark. And having ears, hear ye not? Question mark. Here, brethren, is where he changes now, and he addresses their inability. Okay, I'll bring myself in. As he changes the next four questions, he goes directly to their inability, their unbelief concerning him taking care of them. Anybody here got an amen this morning? You ever get into something and you say, God, I don't know how you're going to do this. I don't know how you're going to take care of me, and yet he always has. And yet we look, we go, God, how is this going to happen? The disciples have seen all of this, and he's asking them, why don't you understand? Where's your reasoning? Why don't you understand this? And then he says this. Remember, look what he says. Look at here the next four. He says, and do ye not what? Remember, look at verse 19. When I break the loaves among the 5,000, how many basketfuls of fragments took ye up? You see what he's doing? He's reminding them, this is what I've done. And you're questioning whether or not I can take care of you. Well, they said, what does it say then? Well, we saw it ourselves. Uh, they say unto him, 12. Look at verse 20. And when the seven among 4,000, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? Question mark. <laughs> and they said, what? Seven. He takes them back to this wonderful miracle that he has performed before their very eyes. And he says to them, how many? How many? Well, 12. Okay, did I not take care of you there? Yeah. How many did I take up with the feeding of the 4,000? Well, seven. Did I not take care of you there? And then look what he says as he closes with his final question to them. And he said unto them, how is it that ye do not understand? Brethren, we are witnessing one of the greatest biblical truths in all scripture. You see God continuing to deal with blind people. Amen? And he is dealing with them in such a way which is most amazing. He deals with those who hate him beyond measure. He's dealing now with disciples who are in this smoky fog, unable to understand exactly what he's doing and what's happening here and who he is. And one of the greatest things as we close this morning, this afternoon now, one of the greatest things we're going to see, Lord willing, next week, Lord willing, amen, is that as Jesus then moves on to the, from those who are totally spiritually blind and willfully blind to those who are walking around in a fog to those who are physically blind, and he does this in order, as we said when we began this portion of Scripture. When he began this portion, he now next week, brother, is going to heal someone who is physically blind. And what's an amazing thing is that as you read on in that chapter, which, Lord willing, we will get to, that is where Jesus says this. As they're standing there looking at him, they, he says to his disciples, who do men say that I am? Oh, some say a good man, some say a prophet, some say Jeremiah, some say this. And he looks at Peter and he goes, uh, it'd be like me, Brother Darrell. Who do you say that I am? And he says this. We have come to know and believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responds to him because as only God can do, open the eyes of the blind and the heart to understand and the ears to hear. He says, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father, which is in heaven. This is an amazing thing, brother, and I always am just amazed at that. You see this, just this, this process as Jesus is dealing with people, the Son of God, as he's drawing them ever closer to the cross. Amen? And finally, that great and glorious day, he turns the light on, and they go, as Howard did in a jail cell, I believe, reading scripture, and he finally says, I got it. I got it. God opened my ears and my eyes to understand it. I got it. Jesus is God. Amen. That's only a work of God, brethren. Think of that wonderful process we're seeing unfold. 
the lesson here that he's teaching us. It really is, to me, a most, can we say it? Amazing thing. Amen. Praise God for his word. Praise God for the Son of God who came in his flesh, in his hypostatic union, perfect man, perfect God, Amen. revealing himself to his people. Wow, that to me is amazing. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you this morning thanking you for Holy Writ, thanking you for uh, inspiring Mark to take up your pen and write down as you carried him along these most important portions of scripture to us. Father, all of us this morning thank you for the canon of scripture, the 66 books which you have preserved down through the annals and history of time. Father, even now this morning we have seen, haven't we, how relevant and needful, as we saw last week with Brother Keith in Psalm 73, how relevant and needful Scripture is to us today. Father, we know that um, there are more than likely someone who's blind here sitting. They're blind spiritually, they're dead spiritually. And uh, Father, we pray for them that you would open their eyes their heart and their ears. Father, uh, we pray for those who are yet, who are sitting here this morning, even as these disciples are sitting in the boat, and they're, they're, they're trying to understand it, what you are saying and teaching. And Father, we pray for them as well, as they're sitting there as opaque as in a foggy cloud, not yet being able to see clearly who Christ is, and the Bible as the inerrant, infallible, perfect word of God, all sufficient word. Father, we pray for them, that as you are drawing them, that you will open their eyes to see. And Father, for those whom you have drawn and they have made that wonderful profession of faith, that wonderful confession of faith, as Peter did and as the other apostles eventually came to those whom you had in your inner circle apart from Judas, those who came to understand. As Thomas, <laughs> oh Lord, I won't believe unless I put my fingers in the nail prints and inside and he did that and Jesus appeared and Thomas said, my Lord and my God. So, Father, to those whom you have lovingly brought them to that place, I pray this morning that this word was most certainly um, an encouragement to them, knowing that we serve a great and mighty God, one who inhabiteth eternity, one who is in all control, who is sovereign over salvation and all other matters. Therefore, we as believers can just do what we've been told to do, go and preach the gospel for the results. Father, you will bring about. So, Father, thank you for that this morning. Father, I think this morning of our brethren who are ill and sick, those who are physically ill, those who are, uh, Lord, not able to even, uh, as my wife, now even able to walk at times. Father, we pray for them. We believe, don't we, brethren, in faith healing, not faith healers. Benny Hinn's not coming over to my house with his jacket. To heal my wife. He couldn't. He wouldn't. He wouldn't be found anywhere near. He's got to find some fake dude sitting in a wheelchair somewhere. But Father, you can. You can heal. And we believe that this morning. We believe that for all our brethren. And Lord, again, for those who are maybe having a spiritual battle right now. And boy, sometimes them battles can be low. Father, we pray for them that you'll, you'll uh, lift them up. As you said, a bruised reed you will not break. Mm. Father, again, we thank you for your goodness, your long suffering, your kindness to us. Now, Lord, as we sing, and as I ask Brother Trent to close us in prayer, may you be glorified and lifted high. We ask and pray all these things now in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, well, let's stand up together this morning, and uh, we'll close.